Judges, if you will be kind enough to introduce yourselves. Uh, there we go. Sure, happy to do so. Uh, my name is Thomas Mackey. I'm in the history department at the University of Louisville and with the law school here at the University of Louisville. I'm Rita McCann and I'm a Huntsville, Alabama attorney. And it's nice to see you all today. Good afternoon. I'm Jay Barth. I'm the Chief Education Officer for the City of Little Rock, Arkansas, and a retired uh, professor of American politics at Hendricks College, and super happy to see you today. Yeah. No, it's good to see everybody. Go ahead and introduce yourselves, and, your, uh, and then we'll get started. Hello, my name's Avi Falk, and I'm a junior. I'm Olivia Lari, and I'm a junior. My name's Grace Bean, and I'm also a junior. I'm Chris Closewee, and I'm also a junior. I'm Deshaul, and I'm also a junior. I'm Cameron Courtney, I'm also a junior, and this is our teacher, Peter Gunn. Well, good to see everybody. Delighted you could have given this a shot. Here we go. Uh, again, this is unit three, question two. It opens with a quote. There is nothing I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and in opposition to each other, end quote. What issues led to the formation of the original political parties? To what extent have those issues persisted in American political parties? What are the advantages and disadvantages of a unified or divided government? You may begin. Washington warned in his fellow address, the danger of parties, a fire not to be quenched, lest instead of warming, it should consume. Washington argued that factions threaten the common good because they encourage self-interest. The same issues plaguing the 1790s remain unresolved. These issues originate from different understandings of who is responsible for addressing issues, the national or state governments. Ultimately, appearing in three unique, but fundamentally similar debates, economic, foreign, and cultural policy. Hamilton believed that the power of the national government was designed to solve national problems. He interpreted the Elastic Clause to mean as long as legislation is proper, it is within the limits of Congress establishing his argument for a national bank. In contrast, Jefferson disagreed with establishing a bank because he believed the national government should not be involved with this economic policy. In the 1790s and today, foreign policy divides Americans. In 1793, President Washington signed a neutrality proclamation preventing the U.S. from aiding France in its war with Britain. This war put Americans in a bind because the U.S. had a de jure alliance with France, but a de facto economic alliance with Britain. Hamilton supported the proclamation because of its economic benefits, while Jefferson opposed it due to his strong connections with France. Foreign policy debate deepened American domestic partisanship, leading to restrictive immigration policies and political oppression in the Alien and Sedition Act. Notably, many Federalists who were previously opposed the addition of a Bill of Rights supported the Sedition Act, demonstrating the need for the First Amendment. The Civil War demonstrates Adams' fear for the, of the formation of two great parties. Cultural divides over, over slavery reached a boiling point with the election of President Lincoln, causing Southern states to secede from the Union. However, a Northern victory resolved debate over slavery and secession strengthening federalism. The Civil War serves as a cautionary moment for ineffective legislators. Today, Americans remain divided in their economic vision. Under reconciliation, President Biden proposed raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour, which was met with significant Republican pushback. Ultimately, the wage legislation was removed from Biden's bill because it did not qualify as a part of budget reconciliation. Nonetheless, the debate represents a historical argument in modern times. A modern culture war is evident in the legalization of cannabis. According to the federal government, cannabis is a Schedule I drug alongside heroin, yet 12 predominantly Democratic states legalize recre recreational marijuana. Typically, Republicans advocate for state rights except for cultural issues. This cultural issue initiates a break from principalism into pragmatism for both parties. The 1970s foreign policy in the Middle East divided Americans. Multiple embargoes from Arab na nations led to a severe energy crisis. In response, Democrats suggested rationing use of fossil fuels, but President Nixon refused to address the issue, leading to a stressed economy. Foreign policy remains a contentious issue among Americans. Concerns over detention centers question the government's integrity over protecting immigrants' natural rights. Former President Trump suggests when someone comes in, we must immediately bring them back from where they came. On the other hand, Democrats are quick to point out that the 14th Amendment says no state shall violate any person's natural rights. Immigrants are people, therefore, are subject to the same protection as any other U.S. citizen. A unified government entails three components, control over the House, presidency, and a 60-vote majority in the Senate. A divided government occurs when one of the three areas are controlled by the opposing party. Divided government is beneficial because the parties check one another, yielding constitutional legislation. 
One famous example is the McCain-Feingold Act, co-sponsored by a Republican and Democratic senator, led the bill to promote the common good, in this case, by ensuring election security. On the other hand, a divided government brings forth gridlock and partisanship. This is demonstrated best by government shutdowns in 1995, 2013, and 2018. Because Republicans and Democrats disagree on how to spend their budget, the government failed to function entirely. This division creates a gridlock and hinders the progress of the nation as a whole. A strength unified government is its ability to respond in fast and emergency situations. This is best demonstrated in the different ways governments responded to COVID-19. The UK, for example, was able to quickly go into lockdown, expedite testing, and open hospital space. However, one person's speedy response is another's violation of rights. Thank you. We're now ready to answer your question. Oh, good on timing there, guys. Uh, one of my colleagues want to jump in? Go ahead. You think that the political parties and the that we have in our country are, were inevitable? Why or why not? I think the way the government was set up by the framers uh, made parties inevitable just because um, it gives like it gives a clear choice uh, between two decisions. So like um, and like faction with factions, um, there were there's no factions because the U.S. is too big. So yeah, I I, I agree with Chris. Um, I mean, I think George George Washington uh, clearly hoped that government would op operate under civic virtue, but um, Madison and others recognized the inevitability of parties, and that's why they attempted to design a government in in which um, in which uh, which 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 would be prepare for the, these uh, factions. Um, and he talked about this in Federalist Ten when he hoped that uh, when when he mentioned how uh, how uh, factions would check each other and the common good would come from that. To build off of both Avi and Chris, we can see his best when like John Adams was distrustful of faction at the beginning, but ends up becoming a leader of a political party. And this just shows, even though it was never specifically stated in the Constitution, framers believe they knew that government needed parties to keep people and the government accountable to the people. So it was in that inevitable. And that's why Adams became one of the leaders to prevent the other party of uh, threatening any and creating an equal society. And let me jump in and build a little bit on that as the question sort of pitches it as a that political parties are a negative and we've seen that in the 18th century and then they become some legitimate what are the strengths that political parties bring to the united states what uh, what do they facilitate how do they work in a, in a positive or, or negative way but you've talked mostly about negatives so what is it that they can do why do they last? I think uh, political parties last and um, bring to the table uh, two different sides with two different uh, political values and beliefs. Um, I think that's very important, especially in um, a pure democ democratic government. Um, I think uh, having one party or having too many would, would hurt the U.S. as a whole, but I also feel like having two also brings um, about some competition and um, some hatred towards one another uh, between the parties, which we can see um, among uh, the U.S. and today. Yeah, precisely. Um, um, Van, Van Buren talked to, uh, had kind of had this revolutionary idea um, and, and, and that um, politics helped uh, give people a clear choice. So exa exactly what um, Cam was saying. Adding on to Avi, I would like to add that um, having two different parties kind of represents two different values. So typically the Republican Party leads more towards economic issues or involving industry. And then the Democratic Party deals more with moral issues. And this kind of relates to why partisanship and bipartisanship becomes such a big issue in America and how partisanship in more recent years has been more present than bipartisanship. But a more recent example of bipartisanship is the recent bill that was passed The um, the anti-Asian hate crimes bill, and it was a bipartisan vote. So it was a 94 to one vote. And this kind of shows that while the two parties represent two different beliefs, um, moral and economic, they can come together to um, protect the nation and individuals. So I think that's really important. So you all have just now articulated some, some positives about political parties. Uh, but early on, I think your overarching argument is they've got a lot of uh, ongoing challenges. Uh, for the health of democracy. Thinking ahead to your own engagement with 
uh, political and social change uh, in, in the present and especially in the future, do you see yourselves uh, working within political parties or do you see, see yourself working in interest groups or in other ways to create change and why? Um, I would say that I would, to create change, I think I would focus on an interest group within a political party because I think those are more direct and they would um, push forward thing, uh, push forward ideals more. Um, and I think it would specify the core of the group's intentions and that would help uh, get more things done. Um, and then, I mean, I think the truth is uh, it, it's, it's challenging to work outside the party system just with the past the post system that we have currently. So I think to make change, you kind of have to work within the system. Uh, yep. Thanks. So why don't third parties get more traction? Help me out understanding. Why isn't there a third, a fourth, or a fifth way? Well, I mean, the, the, there are um, third parties, like uh, with, Bill Jill, with Jill Stein, I remember, in the 2016 election. Um, but but it, it just with with winner take all systems it's it's, it's challenging to get um, the appropriate number of votes and, and pluralities to 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 gain seats. The bill of Avi, we see it's like a 2000 election, like we Al Gore v Bush. The third party took away a lot of the votes in Florida and lead a lot to Bush winning the Florida state, despite winning the lower votes, he won the overall election. This speaks to how like third parties actually take away votes from the two main parties. So this way, if we had like a ranked uh, choice voting system, this way, uh, third party systems can be more involved with the political parties because it would create a more even society where votes don't get essentially wasted if oh, it goes to the third party. Also adding on to both my colleagues, um, I would say that the media is also a big part of why only two, there's there can only be two political parties because since it's been happening for so long, the media tends to just focus on these two, like Republican, Democrat, and it doesn't really stray from that at all. Um, thinking about where the division between the party comes from, do you sense that that comes more at the national level, is driven by national forces, or really is shaped more by things happening at the states? Um, Grapple a little bit about the role of political parties in the states and how they compare to the national government. Um, I would argue that they start in the states and they spread more to the, uh, they start in the states because um, like with like uh, laboratories of democracy, you see like states are basically the pre-run for the national um, type of government. So if it starts in the states, it'll spread to the national. So that's why I think it's more important um, in states because it spreads. And then, and then I would add that in states, you have more polarization and leading to more extreme views. Uh, and, you know, you can look at um, voting rights and how voting rights are, are more strict in certain states. Um, where, where, and then you, you just have more extremes just because there's, there's less checks due to the, the, just the geography and, and the smaller populace. Give me, give me an example of what, you, what you're talking about. Uh, oh. the, you can go ahead, Grace. I was going to say there's a lot of uh, quantitative data based on political polarization nowadays, especially with the use of social media. So more extremist views of the left and right wings, basically. So I'm sorry, I'll just finish my thought really quickly. So basically, there's um, there was a Brown study that showed that um, you can use social media to show the political polarization of the two different parties and how it's mostly in younger people who are on social media showing their political opinions and the use of politics in social media is much is a much more recent thing. And it's viewed in the state rather than the nation as a whole, because typically there's like red states and blue states. And within the state, the social media that's being used in that state is showing a very more extremist view than how things may be perceived in person. And oh, I mean, look. I know I know we're out of time, but I'll just say that Georgia, Georgia tax bill, uh, just to be specific. I, I know you might not be able to count it, but. All right. Uh, 
Look, uh, this is tough stuff uh, that people have been grappling with these, this evergreen issue of how do we channel these powerful po personalities and issues into public policy in one way or another since the 18th century to today. So it's divide, it, it, we've had Congresses and Houses and Supreme Courts worry about it. So of course we're gonna have high school students <laughs> solve it all for us, right? Uh, okay, maybe not, but um, I thought you did an interesting job of covering the waterfront, of uh, uh, bringing up some of the major issues and analyzing them. I thought Ms. Lowry did a very creative job. Uh, my colleague tried to put her on a horns of a dilemma of are you going to work in parties or interest groups? And she said, oh, interest groups within parties and split the, uh, the, the, the dilemma in half. I thought that was very nice. Good thinking on your feed. I like the group. I thought you did a good job of covering the waterfront. Uh, nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think you showed a lot of grace under pressure and, um, and, and, and didn't, you know, these were challenging issues and challenging questions. And I thought you really, um, um, you know, sh showed a tremendous amount of uh, skill and aptitude. I thought you also showed, you know, great teamwork. I thought you really listened to one another and really moved it across. I mean, you're a large group and you were still able to uh, really get folks involved in a, in a short amount of time. So very good, jo good job there. Thank you. I thought you showed me that you had a depth of understanding of the reality of the way our politics are right now. And that is that you know that, that the local politics are extreme and it doesn't, it, it doesn't translate the way, uh, the way it could. And then at the same time, it has a great deal of impact. Um, and when you, I don't care if it counts or doesn't count, the fact that you knew that it was Georgia, was a pretty big deal. Um, I was looking forward to going to the All-Star game this summer. So, you know, it's, it was, we don't get to go now. Um, I, I really appreciate all the preparation and all the hard work and I love your background. And um, uh, I agree with Jay, y'all all work together just great. Roger, it's nice to see you. I'm sorry we're not getting to visit. So thank y'all all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Good work, folks. Okay, breathe. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so unit four, we 